Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Clement Cham from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Let me start by thanking Dr. Partha Biswas, as well as the Scientific Committee of the All India Ophthalmological Society for inviting me to share with you some of my ideas on the surgical management for primary angle closure glaucoma. Now these are my financial disclosures, as well as the government funding that has supported our PACG work. Now in my other talk at this meeting, I covered a management algorithm for primary angle closure disease, and I've separated uh, the clinical scenarios into two hypothetical situations at the two extreme ends of the clinical spectrum. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all these uh, scenarios again, but I think it's suffice to say that in a lot of situations, we would have to decide whether it is plateau iris or the lens being the main mechanism leading to angle closure. And if it is plateau iris syndrome, then we consider argon laser peripheral iridoplasty. Whereas if it is the lens being the main mechanism leading to angle closure, we will have to consider lens extraction as a treatment modality. And in this treatment algorithm, you will also see that sometimes just with cataract or lens extraction alone, it may not be enough and we have to combine it with other IOP lowering surgery. And also there are times when um, you may have to carry out other IOP lowering procedures with or without the lens extraction too. So in the rest of this talk, uh, in the, once again, in the interest of time, I'll focus on two particular treatment modalities commonly used in primary angle closure disease, which is argon laser peripheral iridoplasty, mainly targeting plateau iris syndrome, as well as a lens extraction treatment spectrum, which involves lens extraction together with other IOP lowering procedures for primary angle closure disease. Now, first of all, let us start with argon laser peripheral iridoplasty. This is basically a laser technique that involves the application of laser contraction burns in the far extreme periphery of the iris. These laser burns contract the iris stroma, thins the uh, peripheral iris, and thereby mechanically pulls open at a positionally close drainage angle. Now, typical laser parameters uh, that we use a larger spot sizes of about 500 to 1,000 microns. We use a relatively longer duration of around half a second. And for brown iris, we normally start from a lower power setting of about 150 to 250 milliwatts. Now, one of the by far commonest reasons why people think that laser peripheral iridoplasty do not work is because the laser spots are applied too centrally they are not applied peripheral enough. Now you can see that on the left-hand side here in this UBM image, there is very good thinning of the peripheral iris after laser peripheral, peripheral iridoplasty, and there's good widening of the drainage angle over the peripheral uh, anterior chamber. Whereas in the right-hand photograph here, even though there is good thinning of the iris stroma, but because the laser spot is not being applied peripheral enough, the thinning of the iris does not serve the purpose of widening the drainage angle. So it is extremely important that you aim your laser at as far periphery of the iris as you can. Now, during the procedure, you would also have to titrate the laser power against what you see. So if there is no contraction, you have to increase the laser power. Whereas if you see bubble formation, iris charring, pigment release, or if you hear a pop sound, then you may have to decrease your laser power. Now with this procedure, we normally use topical anesthesia with an Abraham contact lens. You can see that as soon as the laser spot is applied, there's contraction of the iris towards the laser spot. And this both thins the peripheral iris as well as pull their positional closure away from the drainage angle and widen the drainage angle, opens their positionally closed drainage angle. This is a very effective and safe procedure for this purpose. Now, so in summary, I would say argon laser peripheral iridoplasty is simple and safe. It effectively opens up a positionally closed portions of the angle, but it does not 
replace iridotomy, and it also is not effective in opening peripheral anterior synechiae. And this is very useful in various situations of acquisitional angle closure. Now, based on the previous uh, algorithm I presented to you, you will see that lens extraction is very often the first intervention of choice in primary angle closure disease, particularly when there is visually significant cataract or when the lens is considered a major contributing factor leading to angle closure and that IOP reduction is indicated. Now, lens extraction alone may not be sufficient if there is very advanced glaucometer's optic neuropathy necessitating a very low target intraocular pressure, or if the intraocular pressure is grossly uncontrolled. For example, if there is very high intraocular pressure and or a very high dependence on IOP lowering drugs, then you may have to consider combining the lens extraction with another IOP lowering procedure. Now, this is my own personal preferred lens extraction treatment spectrum. Of course, these other, other procedures you are, you are adding on to the phacal modification, this can vary depending on individual patient circumstances and also depending on surgeon's preference. But this here, I'm sharing with you my most commonly used lens extraction treatment spectrum. Now, first of all, uh, in the majority of cases, I may perform phacal emulsification alone. If I need greater IOP reduction, then the next step up is very often combined phacal endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation. And if I need still more IOP reduction, and then the next step further up is very often combined phacal trapeculectomy. You can see that as you move from left to right, there's increasing surgical invasiveness, increasing surgical risk, as well as increasing surgical time. Now this computer simulation here demonstrates to you how phacal ECP is performed, usually after the phacal modification with the anterior chamber deepened with viscoelastic, you can use an endoscope, an anterior chamber endoscope that allows you direct visualization of the ciliary processes. And with the application of the laser, it, it appears that you're painting the ciliary epithelium over the ciliary processes white. And when you do this, it is very important that you make sure as much of the ciliary epithelium is painted white with laser as you can, in particular, in including those areas in the valleys in between the ciliary processes. Now in this table here, I'm trying to compare the clinical outcomes of these three procedures. But first I must acknowledge that this may not be completely scientific because I'm pooling data from two separate randomized controlled trials that our group has performed. Uh, but I think it can still roughly give you an idea how these three procedures compare in terms of the key important clinical outcome measures. Now, in terms of IOP reduction at two years after initial surgery, phacal emulsification can reduce IOP by over 21%, while combined phacal ECP reduces IOP by over 27%, whereas combined phacal trapegalectomy can decrease IOP by over 40%. In terms of drug reduction at two years, phacal emulsification reduced drugs by over 32%, while combined phacal ECP can reduce drugs by over 48%, and combined phacal trapeglectomy is even more effective, reducing drug requirement by over 83%. Now you can see that in terms of surgical complications, understandably, combined phacal trapeglectomy is associated with greater risk of surgical complications, whereas Phacal emulsification alone has a greater chance of requiring additional filtration surgery within the two years after the initial intervention. So this summarizes my preferred lens extraction treatment spectrum once again with phacal emulsification. And if I need more IOP reduction, then combine phacal ECP. And finally, if I want ultimate IOP reduction, then combine phacal trapeculectomy. Now, how do we decide which particular uh, intervention uh, we should go for in the first instance? I think it depends on several considerations. First of all, you have to look at how much IOP and or 
drug reduction is required for that particular eye. And to consider this, you have to look at the preoperative IOP and drug requirement, the glaucoma stage, as well as the target intraocular pressure, and also the patient's age and the rate of progression of the disease. Secondly, you have to how, look at how much surgical risk the patient or the surgeon can accept. But I think most importantly, you have to have a thorough discussion of all the pros, cons, and risk of the different surgical options of the patients before arriving at a final decision. If you are interested to read more about primary angle closure glaucoma, I would recommend to you this textbook, which has recently been published by Springer and is now widely available on many online bookstores. So thank you very much once again for inviting me and thanks very much to all of you as well for your kind attention. Goodbye.